Yes, yes, yes. Sure. <clears throat> okay. Welcome, everyone, to day three. I'm very happy to introduce uh, Professor Olga Mena from IFIC in Valencia, and she's going to talk to us about neutrino cosmology. This is the first lecture out of three. Please, Olga. Thank you very much, uh, Mauricio. Thank you very much, Marcus. Thank you very much for organizing this, and of course, for the students to make it. So, I mean, finally, we are almost back to normal. Let's hope that things improve in this way. So I will tell you about cosmology and neutrinos. And at this point, I don't think we need more motivation, but neutrinos have provided the most robust evidence to look for physics beyond the standard model of elementary particles, where they are predicted to be massless, okay? As you know, in 2015, the Nobel Prize was awarded to Kajita and McDonald for the discovery that neutrinos oscillate, which means implies that neutrinos have masses, okay? And uh, the, 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 the relevance of this discovery is the fact that neutrinos are expected to change our understanding of the history, structure, and the future fate of the universe. And here I put you some examples of how neutrinos are uh, so relevant in cosmology as even noticed by the Forbes magazine, okay? So um, this is a picture of our universe today. We are living in a lambda CDM universe. That is a universe which is mostly made by colder matter, plus some stuff called dark energy, okay? And uh, data seems to point to uh, a, uni a, a universe in which dark energy is represented by a cosmological constant. We will see this later on, okay? So stars, which, me, which seem uh, that are a lot, are just 0.5%. Uh, heavy elements are even less. Hydrogen and helium amount up to 4% to the total mass energy density of the universe. We have dark matter, 25%. Uh, um, dark energy, 70%. The cosmic microwave background, a little, 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 little. And neutrinos. So the question is, how important is our neutrino piece or a slice? Is, this would be a pizza, right? The slice of, of neutrinos. So what is the main purpose of cosmology? So cosmology studies the evolution and, and the large scale structures of the universe. And with large scale, I mean uh, sizes of our Hubble volume, okay? I'm talking about megaparsecs, thousands of megaparsecs, okay? Or hundreds and thousands of megaparsecs. What is a parsec? So I mean, a parsec is a length that we use in cosmology. I don't know if you, you know this already, right? But is the distance that uh, at which um, one astronomical unit, which is the distance between the Earth and the Sun, uh, substance an angle of one arcosecond. Sorry, this I stole it from one of my talks to high school students, and it's in Spanish. So a parsec amounts to come back and back uh, back and forth from the Sun a uh, hundred thousand times. So some scale reminder. So the sun's distance from the center of the galaxy is eight, eight kiloparsecs. Uh, the diameter of our galaxy is 30 kiloparsecs. And when we talk about a large scale structure, we are talking about hundreds and thousands of megaparsecs. So we are looking at the universe as big as it is, okay? This is a brief uh, menu of, of what we are gonna see. We are gonna start with the fundamental ingredients and the thermal history of the universe. Okay, so I'm, I'm not sure if you have seen this before. I guess that if you have had uh, courses on general relativity or cosmology, you have seen. I mean, I'm gonna go a bit fast, but if you want to, to me to, I mean, you want me to explain something in more detail, you just stop me and that's it, okay? So, I mean, as you know, the, the standard cosmology refers to the Freeman Robertson world Primal Lemaitre Robertson Walker cosmology, okay? And it's based into, into in basic ingredients, okay? The geometry, that is the metric, and the dynamics, okay? Which are the Friedman equations, okay? So let's start with the geometry. The geometry assumes that at large scales, the universe is A, homogeneous, B, isotropic. So the most robust conformation of the isotropy of the universe is the CMB, okay? So when one measures this, the, the sky temperature in any direction, right, we observe a temperature of 2.725 Kelvin, okay? So there are small fluctuations that we will see now, but as you can see, this is most almost a perfect black body. These are 
uh, the, the, the PIRAS uh, measurements with 400 sigma error bars enlarged by 400 the errors. So, so can, can you imagine? I mean, the fluctuations around this mean temperature are of the order of 10 to the minus 5. Here, I don't know what it is, but it, it, this it shouldn't be here. <laughs> so here we have the COVID uh, microwave sky, and uh, the existence of this was already predicted by, by, by Alfred and, Her and Herman. In, in, uh, in 1948, while working on BBN, and Precious and Wilson discovered it, uh, it in, in a total accidental way. I know you have heard the story, right? I mean, they were building, a, uh, they were working for the Bell Laboratories, and they were building a, a, an antenna, and there was a noise. And uh, they were uh, awarded with the Nobel Prize for Physics for the discovery. Here is a cartoon, right? They thought that was a, a pigeon there, right? But it was not a pigeon there. They, they called Robert D. To discuss about this, and then uh, I mean, the, it is fantastic when they realize that they, the, that there was a cosmic background radiation, right? Which is one of the most powerful tests, uh, powerful proofs of the of the Big Bang theory. Okay, so um, so the, the the radiation in the universe has a mean temperature of two point seventy two five Kelvin, and there are, however, fluctuations around this mean temperature as measured. Here by the Planck satellite from the uh, uh, from the ESA. Okay, notice that these fluctuations go from minus 300 micro Kelvin to plus 300 mi mi uh, micro Kelvin, and this is just telling us how the temperature in the sky changes with different patches. Okay, so these I mean, these fluctuations are just a, 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 a due to 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 the to the um, Baryon photon fluid in the early universe. Okay, so in the early universe, baryons and photons are tightly coupled. Okay, they behave as a unique fluid, and as gravity tries, the the the, 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 the baryons are sitting here. Oops, sorry. Well, I mean the baryons are sitting here in these gravitational potential wells. Okay, so as gravity tries to compress the fluid, the radiation pressure persists, and then we have these oscillations. It's always again between pressure. Okay, and gravity. Okay, so the potential wells, which are associated to high density, will be uh, translated as cold spots. Okay, in the in the semi maps. Why? Because photons will lose energy to climb out from these gravitational potential wells. Okay, instead the potential hills. Okay, here will correspond to low density uh, regions and are hot uh, spots in the semi map. And here you can see these beautiful images from WMAP and from um, Planck. So there are 410 photons per centimeter cube, or for the Americans, uh, 7,000 <laughs> photons per inch cube. Okay, so let's continue. Okay, At another, another very important thing is that the universe okay, is homogeneous. So when we look nearby, we don't see homogeneity, of course, it's like a mess, right? But when we look really, really far away, right, we see that we have that there is a pattern, right? That the universe is homogeneous. That is, galaxies and clusters of galaxies are equally distributed in the sky, okay? They are not random, okay? So the universe is homogeneous. And here I show you a picture from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, okay, in which you can see that by observing millions, millions of distant uh, galaxies and quasars, we are able to really test the large scale structure of the, of the universe. Okay, here is data. Uh, here is the, the result. Or here I show you the result of data taken during the last uh, 20 years, basically. Okay, here are the, uh, so we have Lyman Alpha Forest. I will explain you later on quasars. We have uh, emission line galaxies here. We have luminous red galaxies. We have uh, uh, another set of luminous red galaxies and also bright galaxies. So these are these are the so-called pi 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 charts, right? and we are looking back in time, right? So here is the universe is 13.8 giga years old, let's say, and we are looking back in time. So we are here, and then we are back here, right? Okay. So as we go, we are looking in in, in, in the past, in, in in the past. Okay. So let's continue now. I will show you now a movie. <laughs> the 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 is is off. No, I think it's, it should be. Okay, because maybe they are like a movie, very nice movie made. It's a real movie. This is a movie done with real images from galaxies. 400,000 galaxies here. Okay, this is uh, data from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Okay, 
Um, so these are pictures, and with pictures, we have made this movie, okay? I was part of this, of this um, collaboration during uh, almost um, a year. So let's come back to reality and to our thing, right? So the metric, okay, okay. Uh, G mu nu connects the value of the coordinates to the more physical measure of the of the of the, of the, of the interval, right? We call proper time this the square, sorry, uh, the square here, okay. And the x zero refers to the timeline component, and um, um, the last three are the spatial coordinates, okay? You know that. G mu nu is the metric that is necessarily symmetric. In, in a special real activity, we will be the, it will be the Minkowski metric, okay? That will be minus one, 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 one. But in an expanding homogeneous and isotropic universe, the metric is the Freeman Lemaitre Robertson Walker one, right? In which we have this A here, right? A, the, the, we have the, 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 the time uh, part and we have the, the spatial uh, com co components, right? And we have here, which is the, called the scale factor, okay? So here, if the universe is flat, here, K equals zero, that is what observations point to, okay? We have just this metric here, okay? Quite simple metric, okay? So, um, the spatial geometry then depends on the curvature, so we can we can have three different geometries. The universe could be closed, uh, open, or flat. Okay, and you can see this. Uh, I mean, with this uh, ET, right? That it, the, the examples of an, an open and closed and a, and a flat universe. Okay, so you have two uh, or just two um, light rays. They will come back, or they will diverge, or they will never ever cross each other. Okay. Depending on the curvature here, on the value of the curvature, okay. Current observations point to a flat universe, okay? Are very close to a flat universe. So, geodesics, what is a geodesic? Do you remember what is a geodesic? Geodesic refers to the path followed by a particle in the absence of any forces, okay? And in the Minkowski metric, it will be a straight line. And, um, but in, a, in, in the context of an expanding universe, as the one we are living in, in it should be generalized to this expression. Where here we have the, the, the Christoffel symbol, which have just the derivative of the metric, okay? So we can apply this, this, this geodesic equation to compute the particle's energy, how the particle energy changes as the universe expands. And we can just see that as the universe expands, particles lose energy. I mean, okay, you can see this as, as, the, as the wavelengths associated to any particle, right? As the particle, as the universe expands, the wavelength becomes larger and larger and larger, and therefore the energy will become lo lower and lower and lower, okay? So the energy of the particles scale as one over a, okay, here, okay? So just simple ideas that you should remind, okay? So there are, in, in cosmology, there are two types of distances, no problem, I'm going fast, but, if, but it's just to, to put you in context. If I, if I really believe that there is something really important, I say, hey, here, okay? So, <laughs> so there are two types of distances, the radial distance and the angular di diameter distance. And we use this to measure, uh, to measure volumes and number, of, and number densities, galaxy number densities, distance to supernovae, the angular size of the, of the, of the, of the universe of photon decoupling. That's why we need this, uh, this uh, mathematical tools, okay? to measure distances in the universe. So at the horizon, so what is the horizon? And also it's good that you have these concepts and you have heard about these concepts because are crucial for, for some, sometimes, even people, they, they, you know, I mean, people normally, they think that I'm a physicist and then they ask you things like, okay, and this of the graph and you are like, I don't know about the graph. And, uh, so, you know, I mean, we have to be open-minded and know about other things, right? So, I mean, not only our theories, in, uh, on, on our speciality. So, I mean, the distance that light has traveled without interactions since the beginning of the universe until the present is, not, uh, is, is, is known as the commoving horizon, okay? So, the commoving horizon corresponds to the conformal time, okay? And assuming that uh, C is equal one, this is the commoving horizon, where A of T is the scale factor, okay, that appears in the metric, okay? So the commoving horizon equals to the causal distance, okay? So this is the eternal problem we have in cosmology, right? I mean, so regions that lay apart from each other by a distance larger than the commoving horizon were never in causal contact. So then this is called the horizon pro pro uh, problem because when we look at the universe at large scales, 
it's homogeneous and isotropic. And if these regions were never ever in causal contact, how is it possible that it's so uniform? And, right? So, I mean, this is the, the horizon problem, and this is why inflation is there. So, the Hubble parameter, very important, okay? The Hubble parameter is defined as the derivative of the, of the, of the, of the scale factor. Um, of the logarithm of the of the scale factor, okay? So dA dt over A, okay? And then we can obtain the cosmic time, that is the, the age of the universe, as the integral of the uh, Hubble parameter, okay? So the Hubble parameter is something super, super important, and we are gonna see it uh, a lot, right? So, um, so this is what I just explained you, right? I mean, imagine that, the universe, right, is made of particles with a wavelength, right? So as the universe expands, this wavelength will be larger and larger and larger, and the universe and the particles will lose energy. Okay, the universe will become co uh, um, cooler and cooler and cooler from something that was very 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 hot. Okay, so important to uh, the relation between the scale factor and the redshift. Okay, so. If we interpret the redshift as the Doppler effect here, as the as the as the universe expands, the galaxies recede. That is, they move farther away, right? In an expanding universe, we know this already, right? Because uh, uh, have a guy, a, a very smart guy called Hubble, oops, um, already found this. Okay, so uh, the Hubble law can be written as the limit when the redshift uh, for very very small, uh, small redshifts. To the, uh, to the commoving distance. Okay, so here is the commoving distance as a function of, of the Hubble parameter in terms of the, of the scale factor or in terms of the, of the redshift. Okay, and if we expand this, right, in the, in the low C limit, that is when we are applying the, the, the Hubble law, okay, so we can see that there is a really uh, um, uh, direct, uh, is a, a proportionality, right, between the redshift, right, and the distance to a galaxy, okay? So you can see here this, the redshift and the distance, right? And the const, this constant of proportionality is the so-called Hubble constant, okay? So in, 20, in 1929, uh, Edwin Hubble measured the spectra of hundreds of galaxies, right? And uh, they, they discovered that they are redshifted, meaning that the universe is expanding. And the, fa the, the farther the galaxy is located, the faster, the faster it moves away from us, okay? So, now we have a measurements of, of the Hubble constant, and we have the Hubble probes of the early universe here. The Hubble, the Hubble constant measurements, we, how do we measure the, the, the Hubble constant? Looking at the cephates, okay? The cephates are, uh, uh, are uh, stars, right? Which are, um, la, the luminosity follows a very precise and regular period, okay? And knowing such a relation, we, we can know where the distance, where the, where, where the star is located and then the distance, okay? Now, this is how we measure the Hubble constant, okay? So here we have ground-based observatories in 1990. Then we, got, we go to the Hubble Deep Field in 1995. Then, uh, then 2010, the Hubble Ultra Deep Field started. And you see how we are looking back, more and more back in the universe. So. Today we have the, few, the the Hubble Space Telescope, and yesterday was a very important day, as you know, because the first images were released. Right here, I put you a movie of 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 uh, made made by these by these uh, institutions. So I mean, you can see there is no sound here. So you can see how right from the Hubble we we go to, to the to the to the I don't know why the movie is not starting. It doesn't matter. Okay, I mean, it was a movie just to show you how how the, 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 the flight of the Hubble and the flight of the, of the James W telescope. So if, if the Hubble looked at the universe when it was a teenager, the James W telescope will look at the universe when, it's at, when the universe was like a four years kid or okay, four years old kid, okay? So we are looking back in time. So I mean, okay, so uh, they are completely different, right? I mean, so uh, I did, um, the Hubble was, at 570 kilometers from the Earth, Webb is in is located here, 1.5 million kilometers. So I mean, do you know what is L2? Yeah. Okay. Very good. Very good. You get a straight ring. So, <laughs> but the question is, you know how to compute it? Okay. So okay. So whoever computes it, I mean, an extra ring. Okay. So very good. So I mean. You know why, why it's important to go to the infrared? 
because I mean, Hubble was Hubble was in the hospital. Why is it important to go to the infrared? Do you know that? Okay, another study. Okay, because dust is is transparent to infrared. So I mean, we can see what Hubble couldn't see. James Webb Telescope has a special glasses, let's say, that can see, okay? Here is the, 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 the size of the uh, sun shield of, the, of, the, of, of James Webb, and here is the difference in the mirrors, okay? And here I show you some examples. This is the first image, so I mean, what is amazing from this image is that they are able to see really, really, really the spectra of these foreground galaxies here in this image, okay? So I mean, we are able to see uh, galaxies which are 3.1 billion years away from us. So even we can see that these arcs here, which are gra uh, gravitational lens uh, pro, right? That I will explain you what are these arcs are in complete uh, Einstein rings. Okay, so you can see that they 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 have they have checked that they are from the same galaxy. This is another image uh, also from from this right. This is again uh, uh, another uh, galaxy of this first image. This was the second image, which, which is uh, an exoplanet, okay? And then they can check whether or not there is, uh, there is an atmosphere in this exoplanet. This is the third image, the Southern Ring Nebula, and they couldn't see before that there is a binary star, right? There are two stars, and now with, with James Webb Telescope, they have discovered that th there are two uh, stars there. This is another image of a galaxy here, right? That is for that are like five galaxies colliding, and the most important thing is that there, in, there, are, there is inside right uh, an active active uh, black hole, and they are able to measure the composition. Well, not not not, not go into the black hole, but right, but measure what is going on right the, the spectroscopy. So it's amazing, and this is the last one, and this is the Carina Nebula, and I mean, the precision of this image is just to cry, you know, I mean, compared to the HST. To the HST. HST took months, and uh, James Webb Telescope takes, uh, whatever, I mean, not like days, uh, hours, okay, to take this image. But why do we care about this? I mean, why do I care about this? I'm crazy. No, I'm not. Okay. Can I show you a, a, a paper of mine uh, with, um, with my, my students and also with Nick Nedding from the University of Chicago, in which we did simulations about how the galaxy luminosity functions look like for a colder matter component and neutrino water matter of 3 kV. You can see that data now also reach up to here, but James Webb Telescope will be able to test this, this very faint region around here, 10 to the minus 13 or so. And you can see that there is a difference. These are different recipes. And we will be able to distinguish between colder matter and warmer matter cosmologies, okay? So, a part of, uh, I mean, just finish this, this parenthesis with James at the W telescope, but we, it's important for us, right? For neutrinos, it's very important, I mean, so. Um, general relativity, okay? Uh, now we move to the, we look into the geometry, now we look into the dynamics, relates the metric with the matter and the energy content of the universe, okay? So the scale factor will evolve differently depending on what's the stuff in the universe, okay? So matter and energy will tell us how the, how the universe, the, the, the shape of the universe, okay? So famous equations, even my son knows this, okay? So <laughs> Ricci is the, R mu nu is the Ricci tensor, okay? And depends on the metric. And these are the Christopher symbols, which I already explained you before. T mu nu is the, the stuff, the stuff that we have, right? The matter or the energy we have, right? And uh, R is the Ricci scalar, okay? So, I mean, this is just to know that the Friedman equations come from the Einstein equations, okay? So after dinner today, you have to check this, okay? You have to check that these, the components of the Christopher symbols are those. I just give you here the ingredients in case someone is interested to compute this in, in, in detail, okay? So, for instance, the R0, the zero zero component for, for, for the Einstein equations, and should you have done this in the past at some point, right? When you were in, kinder, in kindergarten. <laughs> no, I mean, so you see that this, this working out this here, this expression at first order in, in perturbation theory, of course, right? You will get the first Friedman equation. Very important, okay? Which relates the Hubble evolution, the evolution of the universe, the Hubble parameter with the stuff that we have in the universe, okay? Okay, here, this row, right, is the, is the energy density. T mu, t mu nu 
which is here, right? Here, giving you, is the energy momentum tensor that in the case of an isotropic and perfect fluid is given by this matrix here. Rho, the first component, is the mass energy density and P is the pressure, okay? So we have the first Friedman equation, which tell us that the Hubble, span, the Hubble uh, expansion, or the Hubble uh, rate is equal to eight pi j over three times rho, okay? Or remember that h is a dot over a here, right? And the ij component of the Einstein equations will give us the second Friedman equation, which is this one, okay? Which it relates the expansion of the universe to the stuff that it is. So the first Friedman equation is this one, the second Friedman equation reads as this and give us the accelerated expansion of the unit. So realize that we, are, we have discovered that the universe is expanding. If the universe is expanding, right, this side here, this, uh, this, this term here should be negative, okay? Because otherwise the universe will be expanding, will be, uh, will be uh, not, not mm, sorry, will be expanding, but in, in, not in an accelerated way, okay? The universe is expanding in, a, in an accelerated way, sorry. So the, the, in order to have here this acceleration of the universe, this term here needs to be negative. So it's something really weird, okay? We need something with a negative pressure. This is dark energy, okay? Dark energy is the responsible for the accelerated expansion of the universe, and it's something with negative pressure. This is something really weird. I mean, something that, you know, I mean, it's something really, really strange, okay? So now, how do we obtain the different, the different, how the different components evolve in time, okay? So we have the, 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 the energy momentum tensor, and what we need to do is to do the, 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 the time of evolution of the, of, the, of, the, of the components, okay? So in the absence of external forces, okay, the, the, ener the energy momentum tensor is conserved, okay? So in an expanding universe, this implies that the covariant derivative, not the derivative, but the covariant derivative of the tensor, energy momentum tensor is zero. So applying the covariant derivative to the energy momentum tensor, we can see that how the different components evolve, okay? So they evolve in this way. So given by this expression, where we have the, 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 deriva, the partial derivative of the pressure of the, of, the, of the energy density, sorry, with respect to time, plus three times the, the Hubble uh, rate times, again, rho one plus W, where W is the equation of a state of the fluid should be zero, okay? So, just with this simple formula, we can, we can guess how the, or we can guess, no, we can say, right, we can state and derive how the different components evolve as the universe expands, okay? So, for instance, ma dark matter. Dark matter has zero pressure, okay? So, means that the equation of a state of dark matter is zero, okay? This implies that dark matter goes as, as the universe expands, goes as one over the scale factor Q. This is logic, right? Because, I mean, it's just the number density. I mean, size, 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 right? I mean, it's the volume, right? So, as the universe expands, dark matter just goes one over the Q as dark matter or matter, also baryonic stuff, okay? Radiation instead has a pressure and the equation of a state of radiation is one third. So radiation will scale as A to the minus four, okay? While dark energy, since, the comp since, since this has to be negative, right? in order to have this accelerated expansion of the universe, should have an equation of a state smaller than minus one third, okay? So we'll go in this way, a to the minus three times one plus w, okay? So with these ingredients, we can now write the, the, the Hubble parameter and know how the universe evolves, right? So here we have the first Riemann equation again, which can be written in this way, where H0 is the Hubble constant, okay? I'll tell you about the problem of the Hubble constant later on, okay? And just for your, that you should know that there is a discrepancy, the Hubble constant tension and such, I know you have, I'm sure you have heard about this, right? So the Hubble constant is 100 times H, where H, middle H here is, uh, is 0.7 kilometers per second per megaparsec, is the expansion rate of the universe, okay? Rho critical is given by this expression, okay, by, by this number, sorry, okay, H again is 0.7 roughly, okay, and is 380 squared over 8 pi j, 
And then we have all these, all these components, okay? Don't be scared. So, I mean, it's just, this is the Hubble parameter, okay? Square. And then we have the Hubble constant here, it's zero. And we have the different components. We have matter, we have radiation, and we have dark energy, okay? So, matter. Matter, we will have the component of dark matter here, sorry, plus the component of variance times a to the minus three, okay? For radiation, radiation, we will have the photon component plus the neutrino component, a to the minus four. Dark energy, dark energy will go as the, 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 the component to the, this zero means the amount, the current amount, okay? Times a to the minus three, one plus that energy, okay? These expressions are for a flat universe. If the universe is not flat, we should add the, the, the curvature component. But well, let's forget about this because observations are really consistent with a flat universe. For now, we are assuming that the universe is flat. So we are going to really, uh, 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 I mean, discard, let's say, this, this contribution. Okay? So very important. Hubble parameter, matter contribution, plus radiation contribution, plus dark energy contribution. And they scale like this. Current densities, a to the minus three, a to the minus four, and a to the minus three, one plus W. Notice that if we have a cosmological constant, W is minus one. So the dark energy is constant then, okay? That's why it's called a cosmological constant. It's constant along the, story, the history of the universe, okay? So in a flat universe, the, the, the current amount of matter, dark matter, or baryonic matter, plus radiation, neutrinos and photons, plus dark energy should be one, okay? So look at this, this is amazing. I mean, we are living in an almost flat universe, so we are assuming that the sum of these components is one, okay? So, photons. The cosmic microwave background radiation, I already explained you, right, has an temperature of 2.75 Kelvin, right? And the energy of, of such a photon is given by a boso uh, distribution, okay? And then you can compute the, 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 the energy density, right, in this way, okay? And then you will have the, comp the, the, the relative uh, stuff today, or today is here, uh, is, is this value, to the value of, of, of today is 4.75 times 10 to the minus 5 over a to the four, just doing these integrals, right, which are easy to do. I mean, it's just the, the integral of the, of, the, of the number density. We will see this now, okay? Neutrinos instead, neutrinos are fermions, and then they follow what? They follow a fermi Dirac distribution, okay? So, and we shall see soon, right, neutrinos decoupled from the thermal bar before electron and positron annihilation, and therefore, they didn't share in the entropy released by these annihilations. So they are colder than photons, okay? We will see this now, okay? And the temperatures are related by this factor here, right? Okay, this factor, okay? So neutrinos are colder than photons. Remind this, one of the exercise, exercises that you will have to do is precisely this. Compute the number density of neutrinos today, which is related to the photon, uh, to the photon uh, number density in this way, okay? So, if neutrinos are massive, that we know they are, the, the current uh, uh, um, um, contribution, right, to the total, to the total uh, budget of the uni universe is given by a mu times a mu over the critical uh, density, okay? As here, rho, rho gamma over rho critical, here, rho nu over rho critical, okay? This is another thing you will have to derive. And what data tells us is that Neutrino oscillations tell us that this quantity should be larger than 0 0.0 point that 6 times 10 to the minus 4, while cosmology tells us that this number should be smaller than 2.5 10 to the minus 3. Okay, we are gonna see this, okay? But keep in mind what we are what the universe is made of, okay? So mm, it doesn't want to go up, up. Mm, I don't see. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> oh, no, uh, yeah. And now yes. Okay. Okay. So baryons. Okay. So photons, neutrinos. Okay. Baryons. The baryon density. Okay. Um, cannot differ from temperature measurements. Okay. Okay. So um, we know that the baryon density is this from CMB anisotropies. Okay. From the CMB anisotropies. Also. 
uh, light element abundances or quasar spectra. So we know that variance amount today to roughly uh, 4%, okay? Omega the H squared, remember that H is 0.7. So H squared is 0.5 more or less, okay? So omega B is 4%, basically, okay? Yes. Yeah, very, very basic question, but I always wonder why the data always write these omegas with the product of the H square. What is the reason for that? Because I mean, in the, in the okay, very good question. Because uh, the, the, these are measured by the CMB, in the CMB, and the CMB is sensitive to omega B H square. It's sensitive to this combination. It's not sensitive to omega B. Because you need to measure eight, you, you need to measure eight in a, in, a, in a different way, right? To, to break this uh, this uh, this thing. And, and moreover, there is the discrepancy between high and low regime measures, measurements of phase. But I mean, the CMB peaks are basically sensitive to uh, omega B H squared. Okay, so that's why. So okay, and then we have also the matter. Okay, so the matter uh, a number of observations. We know this, right? I mean. So uh, galaxy rotation curves, galaxy clustering, gravitational laser, there is some stuff in the universe, which is dark matter, right? And dark matter amounts today roughly to uh, 2.25%, uh, okay? Which omega, means that omega dark matter, H squared is roughly 0.12, okay? Uh, so, yes? Um, how do we know this? Yeah, no, but I can see. I uh, know what, they need the people who are not. Uh, thanks. How can we be sure that uh, the dark matter is also pressureless? Because I think that's we assumed, right? That yes, it's also yes, very good, very good. This is what I want. Yeah. So, I mean, observations seem to point that, uh, that dark matter is mostly cold dark matter, that is pressureless, right? Yeah. Because, I mean, in a universe with hot dark matter, for instance, a structure will form in a completely different way. With cold dark matter, smaller objects uh, form uh, uh, first and then by gravitational attraction, you, you get more and more and more stuff. In, in a hot dark matter universe, for instance, first, there are the first objects, and then by, by fragmentation, the, other, the, the, the smaller objects will form, for instance. Mm. This is an example, but there are pro, I mean, there could be a small component of hot dark matter, but mostly it should be pressureless, okay? Just because of large scale structure observations, okay? okay. There are limits also on the sound speed of dark matter and such, okay? So, I mean, Okay. which is really directly related to the pressure, okay? But very good question. Thank you. So, um, but we have something else, dark energy. 1998, right? Just when Super K discovered atmospheric neutrino oscillations, two independent groups, right? Observed that, that type 1A supernovae look much fainter than what we were expecting. So this, what, that, what does it mean? Either that there is some dust that absorbs this light, or that this light has been traveling for a longer time, so that the universe has expanded in a very, very accelerated way. So this light takes more time and therefore looks fainter, okay? Very good. So the evidence for an accelerated expansion of the universe today is 12 sigma. So I mean, dark energy is there. We are living, I mean, we are living in a flat universe, Mostly, and in a flat universe, the evidence for an accelerated expansion is 12 sigma. Okay, so sketch. Here we are, right? Uh, uh, the time goes this way. We are here. That goes to the past. Okay, so there is a period in which the universe is dominated by radiation, which scales as a to the minus four. Okay, a is zero in the beginning of the universe. A is one here. The rest is the other way around. It's infinite in the beginning of the universe, zero to eight. So we have radiation dominated, dominated, a radiation dominated period. Then there is a matter radiation equality, a matter dominated period in which a structure form, and then a, a, a lambda domination right here, in which matter and the, and the cosmological constant are equal, okay? So this is the so-called why now problem also. Why now the matter and the, and the dark energy densities are roughly of the same thing, uh, uh, of the same value, right? This is, otherwise we wouldn't be here, right? I mean, so why, why now, okay? So very good. Uh, this is a, uh, this is a story from my colleague Yvonne Wong. So I mean, some, some important periods in the universe, 
Here we are BBN, right? When 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 the uh, the first elements form, large uh, scattering sur uh, surface, structure formation. Okay, here. So here I am showing you this this before, right? A to the is one. Okay. So matter radiation matter radiation equality happens at, at redshift at around ten to the minus four. The last scattering surface at redshift ten to the sorry uh, ten to the minus sorry a ten to the minus four. Uh, the version was uh, 10,000 or something, right? Uh, yes? Yeah. Tell me, tell me, yes. Oh, like no problem. When was the first exoplanets form? Exoplanets? Or like planets in this diagram? Because, wow, wow, in, order, wow. We because are... in order to have life on them, we should form them the, first. The exoplanets are almost here, it's almost today. Okay, right? okay. So we couldn't live in like in the matter dominate zone. Yeah, I mean, you know, we I mean the thing is that we we to form structures, the universe needs to be dominated by matter. Okay. Because I mean, if you have an accelerated expansion, I mean, you know, I mean things don't cluster, okay. Okay. So in the matter dominated universe, the large scale structure forms. So this, yeah, I mean, this has been quite recent. You mean I mean the, the, the cosmological constant. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, it has been at a ratio of points. Seven or okay. point, well, point seven. I mean, a very low. I mean, not not point seven. Let me think. But much, much, uh, much later. Yeah, yeah. I mean, much later. Okay. So, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, this is very important. Thank God we have this matter radiation matter matter dominated era. Otherwise, the structures cannot form. Okay. Here I show you precisely. Okay. So we are here. This is the size of the uh, of the visible universe. In any case, it's very easy to compute. I mean, you just do omega lambda equal to omega matter one plus c cube. Okay. So then I mean, omega lambda is 0.7 over 0.3 equal to one plus c cube. Right. This is when assuming that it's a cosmological constant. Okay. And then this is with whatever 0.7 over 0.3 minus one. Okay. This is the recipe at which this happens. Okay. Okay, the equality between matter and and and, uh, and a cosmological constant. Okay, so um, let's continue. Here I show you the the, the size. This is the size of the visible universe, and here you have these very important uh, different figures. Okay, and we are gonna see this several times. Okay, so ingredients that you need. You need to know what are the particle distribution functions. Okay. You have the Bose Einstein distribution function and the Fermi Vidal distribution function. Okay. So the number density is the integral of the uh, the degeneracy, okay, for the, of the particles, and is the integral of these distributions. The, the energy density is e, the integral of E times these distributions, and the pressure is the integral of P squared times these distributions. Okay. And the entropy density is given by this expression. Okay. This you will need for, for doing some of the stuff, I, uh, some of the exercises, which are very simple integrals, by the way, right? So, what do we use to learn about the, the, the thermal history of the universe? The Boltzmann equations, okay? You have seen these equations before, I guess, right? Especially people working on dark matter, I mean, right? So, uh, very good. So, I mean, in general, as a rule of thumb, okay, a particle, is, is, is in the thermal bath until the expansion rate is larger than the interaction rate of the particle, right? Okay, so this is like if you are in a disco and you are pretending to, uh, to, to find a friend, and then the disco starts to close and becomes really, really dark and cold, and you cannot find anywhere, nowhere, right? So it's the same, right? As the universe expands, it's the same. So, uh, but an accurate calculation, of course, uh, requires to solve the uh, the the, the Liouville, well this, the, the, the Boltzmann equation in which L is the Liouville operator, which is the total time derivative that in classical mechanics is given by this expression, but in the, in the, the relativistic version is given by this, which is at the Christopher symbols. Okay, and then we have the collision uh, the, the collision operator here, which contains all the interactions that the particles have. Okay, and here you have the uh, the uh, equation for the uh, Within a geometry as we as we are looking at in the in the Freeman Robertson Walker, these are the Boltzmann equations. Okay, so sorry. So um, 
simplifying the processes, okay? Yes, we have one particle interacting with another one going into, an, into other two particles, okay? So we have that the derivative of the number density uh, with respect to time plus three times the Hubble uh, parameter times n is all this stuff, okay? All this stuff is just particle physics stuff. This has the cross section here, this m squared, right? The matrix element squared. So, I mean, we have realized that if particles don't interact, this term here is not present. And therefore, just n goes as a to the minus three. That's it, right? I mean, just because, I mean, n is, imagine a cube. So, I mean, each size of the cube with this, with the, with this, with the, with the, with the scale factor just goes as one over the q, okay? And this is just the, the fact that uh, the, the production rate of one is proportional to the occupation numbers of three and four, and the loss rate of one is proportional to the occupation numbers of one and two, okay? So after defining a thermally average cross-section, this is the expression for the Volman equations, okay? Where the equilibrium densities are given by these expressions, okay? So this is the, this is the stuff we are gonna see, or you are gonna see, in different situations. For instance, in BBN, the neutron to proton ratio, one neutron to uh, mu is or, or sorry, uh, yeah, or, 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 or uh, positrons going to P plus electrons or mu e max. Okay? So we apply the Boltzmann equation to this case. In recombination, we have electrons and protons given neutral hydrogen plus photons. In dark matter production, we have two dark matter, I mean, two dark matter particles annihilating into two other particles, and then realize that for the particular case of dark matter, since these two particles will be in complete equilibrium with the, with the thermal medium, with the thermal plasma, the equation, the Volman equation is simplified to this, to this, to this equation here, right? Okay. Well, maybe it's better if I do like to this equation, okay? The last one, okay? So we are going to apply this. To several, to several, uh, to several, in several stages of the universe. For dark matter relics, for instance, as I told you, we have this equation. We have to solve this equation where this we have two dark matter particles and integrating into 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 two other stuff. It could be two leptons or quarks or or neutrino and neutrino. Okay, and then we have to solve this equation here. If we define the yield as the ratio of the number density over the temperature Q. We have just to solve this equation. This is a ricati like equation. I'm sure that many of you have seen this equation before. Okay. So these are just examples of wh why is the important, why are important the Boltzmann equations. Okay. And then what happens is that at some point, okay, to solve this equation, Dharma, eh, Dharma matter will decouple. Okay. So I mean, th there is a point in which this y equilibrium, the yield of the, of the, of the particles in equilibrium is, is are exponentially suppressed. And the dark matter number density is so low that it does not interact anymore. So it decouples, okay? This is called the, the freeze out, okay? So regularly the freeze out occurs at x, x is the mass over the mass of the dark matter particle over the temperature of 10 or so. So this is the so-called wind miracle. Why? Because if we assume GeV particles, and cross sections of the order of the weak, uh, of the weak uh, scale, weak, weak interacting scale, we get the correct ma uh, dark matter density. Okay, this is why it's so called the wind miracle. Okay, because winds can reproduce wind, winds of GBs can reproduce today the, 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 the amount of dark matter that you observe in the universe. Okay, so this is something I put normally just if you want to do this exercise yourself, but this is just if you want to practice. And of course, if you want to go in more in, in detail in, into cosmology, but it's just, you know, I mean, for your own, uh, I don't know, I mean, if you are really working on something related to this, otherwise, I mean, if you are working on neutrino less double beta decay, I can understand that you're not gonna put, you're not gonna put yourself to compute the age of the universe in this uh, thing, right? I mean, you, you have better things to do. Let me put it this way. I mean, I'm married to an neutrino experimentalist. So, I mean, you know, so I know how important is that is to make things work, right? So <laughs> it's what he tells me, right? But what did you make today work? And I said, I don't know, nothing. <laughs> anyway, so particle decoupling in the early universe, we are neutrino decoupling, okay? So neutrino decouples from the thermal bath, when the temperature of the universe was roughly one MeV, okay, 
and uh, the age of the universe was around one second. Okay, the universe was one second. All right at well, the, the time go, time goes this way. Okay, so look at here, Nintendo decoupling, energy, energies. Okay, so we are seeing that a very straightforward rule is that a particle decouples when the 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 the, 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 the thermal uh, the thermal um, uh, interacting rate, let's say, is smaller than the Hubble expansion rate. Okay. So neutrinos all interact via weak interactions, right? This is the rate, right? Is n sigma d, right? So n goes as t to the q, and then we have sigma d, which goes as g Fermi squared times the temperature squared. So it goes as gf squared t to the phi. While the expansion rate of the universe is given by the Hubble factor, okay? And we have seen that at that time, the universe is radiate radiation dominated and therefore h squared goes as t to the four okay so the the, the ratio of these two quantities okay the, the, the thermal uh, uh, the thermal um, interaction rate and the Hubble parameter are the same uh, around one mv so neutrinos decouple from the thermal bath when the temperature is one mv roughly okay so as i told you before they don't inherit any of the energy associated to electron positron annihilations, which happened right after the, after neutrino decoupling. Okay, so how are the photon and the neutrino temperature related? So electron positron annihilations takes place after neutrino decoupling. The entropy density, I think I defined it already, but is rho plus p divided by the temperature. Okay, so in an expanding universe, the entropy density per commutable volume is conserved. So the contribution to this S from bosons is given by this expression, while the contribution to this S from fermions is given by this expression. Before electron positron annihilation, we have electrons, positrons, neutrinos, antineutrinos, and photons. And therefore, the entropy density before electron positron annihilation is given by this expression. After only neutrinos, antineutrinos, and photons, but they are going to be at a different temperature, okay? Because neutrinos have already decoupled. So, equating this S1 and S, uh, S, S at a scale factor one and S at a scale factor two, right? And multiplying by A1 square, A1 to the cube and A2 to the, and A2 to the cube because it's the co moving entropy density, we can guess or we can not guess, but we can uh, really compute the, the, the relation between the neutrino temperature and the photon temperature, okay? And it's this factor here, okay? So neutrinos are colder than photons by this factor, okay? So what is an effective? You have seen this before, right? An effective is the number of neutrinos, and uh, it seems that it, it, it turns out that the total radiation in the universe can be written as the uh, as the total radiation of the universe is given by, um, uh, by omega r h square is given by the photon contribution plus the radiation contribution okay so in a standard scenario in the standard scenario an effective is 3.0440 which comes from the contribution from electron neon and neutrinos it's not three we are going to see why it's not three and also tomorrow we will have a as a, a, a seminar from Michael that will even explain much better than myself why it's not true, okay? So, <laughs> but there could be scenarios in which an effective is smaller than, than these numbers or is larger, for instance, if there are sterile species or if neutrinos or if neutrinos decay, okay? So I, how much time do you have? Um, maybe five more minutes. Okay, so I mean, so this is the number, okay? Keep in mind this number and then you will tell me, but I mean, if they are sterile and they don't interact with other particles, how cosmology measures them? So I mean, the, that's the dark side of the gravitational force, okay? Because they contribute to gravity, okay? So uh, I think I, I will, uh, let me see. I mean, I think I will stop here probably because um, if I start with this, uh, one second, uh, wait, one second, I'm gonna say something because or, or I might continue if, if they can. But since I have given them so much information in such a little time, they, they, I'm sure they have 
their head now like this, and I don't know if they can follow this or not, but uh, one second, maybe. Um, yeah, I mean, because this is all, this is to get into, into neutrino decoupling in the LA universe, and why is not three the, the, the number, right? And why we have this departure from three, uh, one second, just one second. Uh, I don't know why. One second. It's opening the. Okay. So, um, just one second, guys. Well, I could, I could, I could tell you about. Uh, yeah. Okay. One second. One second. Okay. Yeah. I'm gonna. I'm gonna just. Finish with this and that's it. Because Marcus will tell us tomorrow. Uh, yeah. Uh, sorry. You know, I mean, yeah, no, because I work with Ras with Marcus. Uh, sorry. Ras. Sorry, I apologize. I need. I call. I was last week with him, and I was calling him Ras. Um. So this is why it's not three exactly. Okay. The number of the number of, of an effective. Okay, so when 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 we compute this, we assume that all particles behave as ideal gases. This is one of the approximations we made. Also, that the neutrino decoupling processes is ha happens really at p equal to mu equal to decoupling. So this is the instantaneous uh, approximation. That is that suddenly it, it goes from a from a tight thermal contact contact to a state of thermal contact with the, with, the, with the other stuff, okay? The neutrino bath, I mean. And then another approximation is, is that the electron positron spectrum is fully relativistic, okay? This is another approximation, the ultra relativistic approximation. So we are making three approximations, okay? But in reality, what happens is that... Um, again. Ah, yeah, okay is that we have we have a stand, uh, we have the different corrections to, to, to this number of an effective right for instance the first one is the uh, the, the first one i'm going to tell you now is the uh, this m, m, m over tb correction the, the, the ultra relativistic approximation that we will see more tomorrow of course um, is that the electron positron um, population is fully relativistic but this is not true okay of course it's, it's not well satisfied in reality so there will be a change in the QED uh, plasma entropy induced by, by, by this term, okay? And then when we, when we compute this, right, we will see that there is a contribution, extra contribution of 0.04 to this three. It should be three, but when we relax this assumption that is not true, that the electron positron path is fully relativistic when the neutrinos decouple, okay, we will have an extra contribution, okay? So, this is simply is, is, is that it's not a temporary localized, localized event at 0.5 uh, MeV. But just to keep in mind, this is a very, very important contribution. Look at here, 0.04, uh, oh, oh okay? So we will see more at uh, tomorrow at Rasmus uh, seminar, okay? So let's see if, if, if Seldon stops. Seldon, that's it, okay. <laughs> okay, then the, the next, the next, uh, correction that we have is to assume that neutrinos behave as an ideal gas, but it's not true, okay? There are electromagnetic intera interactions. So this will modify the, the QED uh, uh, equation of a state, okay? So we will have a, a modified QED equation of a state. Here I show you the different contributions, okay? In case uh, you, are, you, are, uh, you are interested in, we have these, these different contributions in different, uh, different orders in perturbation theory, okay? So we have here the contributions from the first two, uh, the, uh, or, or order E squared, E cubed, and here the, the corrections to the weak rate, and contribute to 0.01 minus, minus one, 10 to the minus three, and smaller than 10 to the minus four. So really, this contribution from, from this last row is not from this last diagram, sorry. Uh, the last diagram. The last diagram, those cases, is not so important. It's only 10 to the minus four, okay? While the other are important. So Rasmus again will tell us more about this. And then 
another correction, I told you that there were three, right? This is the third one. The third one is induced by non-instantaneous neutrino decoupling plasma, uh, pl uh, plus thermal distortion, right? What happens is that neutrino decoupling and electron positron annihilation are quite close in time. It's not that they are separated by, by, by giga years, okay? So uh, there are re still relic interactions between uh, electrons, positrons, and neutrinos at, at, the, at temperatures smaller than the medium, okay? So these processes are more efficient for neutrinos with larger momentum, okay? And therefore, what they do is that they, they induce uh, spectral distortions, okay? And this contributes to minus, to a factor of minus 0.005, okay? So here you can see this, this is the reference. So the, the, there, are spectral, there are spectral distortions due to this, this, uh, this approximation, okay? So at the end, what happens is that we have these corrections and also, so that we have flavor oscillations, but flavor oscillations really are really, really tiny, the contribution of flavor oscillations are 0 0.005, okay? So compared to the other, to the other contributions are, are subdominant, of course, okay? But keep this number in mind that is um, 3.044, okay? And this extra contribution comes because of this uh, non instantaneous neutrino decoupling, uh, um, the QED corrections to the thermal, uh, to, the, to the finite temperature corrections, sorry, to the QED uh, equation of state, okay? Uh, uh, and also, of course, the ultra relativistic approximation, okay? So keep that. Normally, one does this approximation is three, but if not, we have this extra contribution. These are the ex two of the exercises you will have to do, but now I stop, okay? I think I managed to talk at the speed of light, okay? So, <laughs> but now this is the most important stuff, and then we have time. We will have, have plenty of time. Tomorrow and the day after, you see this quietly, you know what I mean? Eh? These are the two of the exercises you will have to do, but tomorrow we will really start from this slide. Today I really needed to, I really, I was really need to, to show you a bit of, of, of the ingredients, mathematical ingredients. Also, I wanted to show you a bit of the, of the, of the, of the James Webb, right? That was yesterday. And I mean, I was crying in my bedroom in the hotel, like, <laughs> no. <laughs> Anyways, so thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Olga. Um, so we have also now a coffee break where you can uh, ask Olga okay. some questions, but if there are some questions right now, some urgent Yeah, whatever. Questions. I don't take coffee, so you can just, uh, but please feel free to ask me questions, either now or after, whatever. Okay, then I don't see any questions now. Then let's have coffee break and then we come back after. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, sure. uh, five